All right. All right. Good welcome, everybody, who's joined us tonight for this webinar. I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, hope also, the live stream on Facebook is working good. People also joining in on the, that side. Uh, I think we can uh, we can start if everything works. Yes, can everybody hear me? Just let me know if you cannot hear me or if you cannot see the, the presentation anymore. Put it in the chat and we will uh, fix it right away. Yes, so tonight we are gonna talk about drought and pathways for drought resilient agroecological systems. And we will organize this event um, uh, with the help with the, of Agroecology Europe. Um, my name is Aaron and I'm part of Boer Group. And we are organized this uh, uh, event together. Um, this is uh, also part of a big series of Agroecology uh, Europe this year. They organized a lot of events, I already saw, with the, some um, help also of other organizations. And that's also why we, why we uh, reached out to them to organize this event. Let's go to the program. So the program will look at uh, follows. First, I will give a small introduction. Um, as I said, we are live via Zoom and also via Facebook. So if your Zoom connection fails, then you can also go to Facebook. Um, after the introduction, we will we have two uh, two speakers tonight. First speaker is uh, Joost Sliding, uh, who is also part of Boer Group. Um, and after uh, his talk, we will obviously have time for questions. And the second speaker will be uh, Sylvia Quarta. I hope I pronounced it uh, right. And she is, um, yeah, we'll also introduce her later. Um, she will also have a talk of 15 minutes afterwards. We also have time for uh, questions. And then we will, uh, then we will have our discussion at uh, 20 past eight. Uh, which we will do in breakout rooms, and uh, Louise uh, will uh, will make those breakout rooms that time. And then uh, those breakout rooms we do via Zoom. So if you're on Facebook and you want to join the breakout rooms and the discussion, then you have to uh, register for the Zoom and uh, get into the Zoom. So we will have a moment um, at the beginning of the discussion, of course, to, uh, to see if people are uh, coming in from the Facebook. And afterwards, we uh, after the discussion, we have a small wrap up, um, and people can uh, enjoy their the rest of their night. Before I start the introduction, I would like a few words about who are we, who are the organizers of this. So, Agroecology Europe is a European association to promote agroecology. Uh, there's 19 founder organizations, people um, from 10 different countries. So it's really, uh, it's really a European uh, collective, as you may say. And uh, they strive to place agroecology high on the European agenda to, uh, to let the politicians know that it's really important to think about agroecology and to implement it. They encourage uh, interactions between different actors in science also in the in practice and the, the social movements and they do this by organizing events like these and their aim is uh, to uh, create an inclusive european community uh, with all the stakeholders involved in agroecology and uh, like i said i am a part of Boel group and uh, Boel group is a critical student organization uh, Founded in 1971 in uh, Wageningen, so we are part of the university. And uh, Boel Group aims to connect students of the university, but also the researchers and uh, education. We want to connect that to the reality of farming, the challenges that farmers and peasants uh, have in the Netherlands or worldwide, and how they overcome that. Uh, we organize that. We, Organize a lot of different things to uh, reach this goal, so like webinars like these ones, but also we go on excursions to farms uh, close by, but actually uh, different kinds uh, of farms. 
Uh, we have farmers' tales. Those farmers uh, come to speak at the university. And we also have the farm experience internship, which is uh, yeah, a yeah, four week long fest of 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 wonders and and new experiences for a lot of people, where uh, people from all over the world come uh, to Wageningen to uh, to learn about agroecology and all the the great things that uh, that come with it. So if you're interested in uh, any of uh, any of us, any of the things we do, check us out of, on the social media. Then let's get into drought. Uh, drought is, uh, is already a big problem for many years. That's the second most important natural disasters after flooding. And drought is really, uh, there's really big connection with uh, climate change. So um, the increasing temperatures, the altered circulation patterns, so the, the rain uh, patterns that change a lot, they, they um, result in a lot of drought, not only in, uh, in Europe, but uh, also in the, in the global south, where there's already a, a drought problem for longer times, and where it's, it's, uh, some situations are really pressing and uh, food security comes uh, comes under pressure. And in recent years, in the last decade, the, the drought problems also spread uh, from the global south. And now it's also uh, in Europe, there's uh, a lot of farmers who have problems. Uh, yeah, we can see that in the, in the graph that changes in temperatures can increase the frequency in, in drought uh, especially in the in the Mediterranean uh, area, where desertification is also a, a really big problem. So if you look then uh, to agriculture, um, drought is the most limited uh, abiotic stress factor for crop growth, and millions of of, of dollars and euros are, are are wasted every year uh, because of drought. And around 50% of agricultural land is affected by some degree by drought worldwide. And this is only uh, to be increased in the coming years. Because uh, the last few years, the weather, especially in Europe, became very extreme. So unstable weather, uh, periods of extreme uh, rain and periods of extreme drought. And this, um, this made a lot of uh, lands degraded and gave rise of a lot of marginal lands also in Europe. And these marginal lands are, are um, really bad as they lose a lot of their economic value and also a lot of their purpose. So they're actually abandoned. And uh, we need to uh, change that to uh, use these lands once again. Maybe you think that oh, it's a lot of negative things. Are there not any good things happening in, in relation to drought? Yes, there is. There's a lot of different perspectives uh, on, on how the, the drought problem can be, um, can be com combated. Uh, and with a lot of agricultural problems, there's a high uh, and low tech solution. And those are always uh, opposed to each other. So there is not a lot of consensus between different sides um, uh, of the story. And that means that often the focus is on comparing different solutions, which one is better, which one should be implemented uh, on, on a bigger scale. And uh, are things even uh, good enough to be implemented on bigger scale? And that leaves the question, uh, is that the only thing we can do to explore different different strategies. And that's also the idea that we had behind this webinar, that we want to focus not really on the solution itself, but also on the, the idea behind the solution. So what strategy did, um, did our speakers or did, did do researchers use um, to look at the problem that's drought and look how the agricultural systems can be made drought resilient. So that's also what we hope to achieve with this um, this webinar so far. Well, that comes the, the end of the introduction by me, and I uh, would like to give the floor to our first speaker, which is Joost. 
uh, Joost Leidrink uh, studied at the university, Wageningen University, uh, did his master's in agroecology. And as part of his master, he uh, also did some research in collaboration with the university in Copenhagen on deep rooting and perennial grains. And uh, I've heard firsthand that it's a really interesting topic. And currently he's, he's working uh, at the Louis Bock Institute. It's a really important institute for the, the organic agricultural sector. And he's doing research at uh, sustainable livestock farming and uh, agrobiodiversity. But tonight he will focus on, uh, on deep rooting in relation with intercropping as a way of coping with drought. So Joost, I'll uh, give the floor, floor to you. You can... Uh, Thanks, Aaron. Um, okay, I'm sure. share my screen. Okay. Um, yeah, so my name is uh, Joost Leiderink. Um, Aaron introduced me as uh, currently being a researcher at the Louis Bolk Institute, but tonight I will mostly talk about my experience as a student and as uh, uh, some stuff that I got introduced to during uh, the, my thesis period. So um, I will be talking about uh, one solution um, that I would say is an agroecological agro solution um, to uh, improve drought resistance in our agricultural systems. Um, what will I talk about? I will give a brief introduction about drought resistance and deep roots. Um, then I will talk about some theory and um, give you some examples that inspired me and will hopefully also inspire you. And then lastly, I will talk about some um, research uh, about the deep roots and also um, how to do that research and how to select for deep rooting crops. And this will mostly be um, examples from um, some research that I was involved with, or uh, that was also uh, done at the, the institute where I did my thesis in Copenhagen. So drought resistance is quite a big, a very big topic actually. Um, and it can be tackled on multiple levels. So on the, on the right, I try to illustrate this with a kind of a nested, design like so we can we can view the problem from an ecosystem perspective but then zoom in gradually towards a cropping systems approach and then we can have drought resistant crops and what makes these drought these crops drought resistance is maybe their architecture or their anatomy or their physiology and then all the way in the middle is a genomic approach to uh, drought resistance but what I'm mostly interested in as an agroecologist is um, stuff in the middle, basically. And even more so um, things that bridge between, that, that, yeah, that may bridge between these levels um, of perspective. So um, the deep roots ties into crop architecture, of course, but it, I think it, um, with deep roots, you can not only improve your crops, but also uh, cropping systems. Um, so let's begin where I began. Um, I began with the realization, or well, I read that even in severe drought conditions, um, underneath agricultural crops, there is still plenty of water most of the time uh, available, but the crops can just not reach it. Um, and that illustrated here on the right, but this plant, most of the crops, most of the agricultural crops only root into zone, zone A and have some roots in zone B. Um, but there are crops and plants, wild plants, that can root a lot deeper and reach those layers um, where moisture is maintained. And then I also realized uh, while looking into it that uh, in the scientific um, sector, there's not enough, not, not enough people who talk about deep roots and who perform deep root research. Um, and then just as a definition of deep roots, I'm talking about roots that uh, go deeper than one meter. So why deep roots for drought resistance? 
Well, first of all, obviously, uh, roots are the organ responsible for water uptake. So we can, within a crop, there, are, there you, drought resistance is, is regulated in different levels, uh, above ground and below ground. But uh, since roots are the primary organ, well, the organ responsible for water uptake, it's good to tackle the issue right there, I think. Um, deep roots are an evolutionary trait and an adaptive response to take up um, uh, water uh, during drought. So that's also why uh, I chose this topic. Um, deep roots can reduce the influence of surface stresses. Drought is usually, uh, well, drought is uh, something that happens uh, from the outside, of course, from the from the air downwards. So if you can put deeper, you might evade the drought um, partially or completely. And uh, deep roots are also capable of more than just the water uptake. And I will come back to that later. And here on the right, you see an example of the droughts, uh, uh, some, some images of uh, what it looks like during the summers in, in, in Holland over the last couple of years. So the maize is drying up. Also the shallow rooting grasses on the side are drying up, but the deeply rooting weeds and also the trees are still green. So just to give an example. Then also a call for deep root research uh, because the, the green revolution mindset of higher input agriculture has focused on the above ground gains and assigned by roots. Uh, but um, another reason that not a lot of root, deep root research has been done is because it's uh, quite hard and uh, tedious. So out of 48,000 studies that reference plant roots or 8,200 that reference fine roots in the literature uh, out there, there are only a handful, um, a couple hundred that are about uh, deep rooting. And uh, only a fraction of those is about crops. Um, so crop research has mostly focused on uh, the roots in the top one meter of the soil. And this bias has limited our knowledge about deep roots and rooting and caused the great underestimation of the functioning and capabilities of deep root systems. So now I would like to go a bit more into those capabilities. So uh, deep root growth can determine access to water. So crops take up water from the soil. And as the season progresses, the topsoil becomes more dry and more dry. And this is uh, also coupled with a re reduction in rainfall during summer relative to winter. So it's important for a crop to be able to follow the soil moisture gradient during this, during this season. Um, and then also, this is uh, taking wheat as an example. Um, the rooting depth, the maximum rooting depth is uh, reached uh, when the crop starts flowering. Um, but the water that's taken up after flowering is actually a lot more uh, important to determine the crop yield. So it's important that a crop reaches maximum rooting depth when there is still adequate soil moisture in the, in the soil. Uh, because this water taken up after flowering contributes directly to yield, uh, whereas before flowering it contributes also to uh, regular crop growth. So every drop of water that's taken up over the whole growing season um, is uh, relatively contributes one uh, yield unit, in this case, the bread. But after flowering, uh, one drop of water is actually worth not only one, not two, but two, three yield units of bread. So every millimeter of water that's taken up after uh, flowering um, gives us 55 to 6, 77 uh, kilograms of extra grains per hectare. And this can result into and up to 25% yield benefit in dry seasons. Um, then I already touched upon this, but I think deep roots are really interesting also because they combine so nicely with diversity. So if we look at cropping systems in crop rotations, for example, you will see an, an example of what regular crops in a regular crop rotation um, how much of the soil they can explore and, and get their resources from. And then as we go down, uh, we see an increasingly deep rooting uh, crop rotation. And we see that a greater portion of the soil is, is explored. And uh, this means that there is a more complete use of, of resources, but also less losses, which is 
just as important. Um, but also in intercropping and agroforestry systems, um, there's a benefit of deep roots. And here we see that uh, in a normal forestry system, um, I think this was walnut trees. Um, walnut trees have a rather uh, uh, shallow rooting system, rooting up to like 1.5 meters or two meters. But in the agroforestry system where there is uh, crops uh, intercropped with the trees, um, the walnuts kind of shifts to a very much, very more, uh, much more deep rooting uh, root profile, as you can see here. So it sacrifices shallow roots in order to build a deep root system and thereby evade uh, competition. Uh, another really cool thing about intercropping uh, and deep roots is that uh, it's called hydraulic lift. Um, and hydraulic lift happens, um, now let me start. Uh, on the picture on the left side, you see what happens during the day with plants. So plants take up water, the uh, plants act as a conduit for the water and moves through the plant towards the atmosphere. But at night, the stomata appears. And on the top you see, uh, for those who don't know what a stomata is, but that uh, stomata is the are the pores and leaves where a gas exchange happens. So when these close, uh, uh, water cannot exit the plant anymore directly to, uh, into the atmosphere. Um, so during the day when the sun pressure, the water pressure in the soil is high, in the air is low, so it moves from high pressure to low pressure. Uh, during the night, the lowest pressure, because the stomata are closed, is found in the topsoil. So water is still taken up in, so in moist subsoil layers, but is then transported uh, towards uh, the roots, towards the topsoil, and makes the topsoil wet again during the night. And this means that during the next day, uh, the plants can rely on this topsoil water again. Um, and you can kind of see this as an ecological form of irrigation. So instead of using uh, irrigation systems where we use outside uh, sources of uh, external sources of water, we can use uh, water that would otherwise not be used from the soil itself. Um, and plants are able to, um, to restore 14 to 100% of their daily uh, requirements uh, of water through this, uh, through this uh, phenomenon. And uh, deep root crops can also irrigate their neighboring intercrops. So uh, in, a, in a system, um, shallow rooted neighbors were uh, able to use three to 60% of the water that was uh, hydraulically lifted by maple trees, um, but also uh, more uh, conventional agricultural crops can, um, like pigeon pea, which is deeply rooted, can supply shallow rooted maize with water that the maize itself had no access to. And uh, pearl millet, for example, um, re reduced and improved uh, rice yields through hydraulic lift. And the cool thing about this is, is that the process is completely free and it's solar powered without needing any solar cells or uh, high technology. Um, besides deep roots, as I already mentioned, uh, for water uptake, deep roots have uh, many other uh, cool effects to them. So they also reduce, whenever a crop takes up deep water, it also takes up the nitrogen that's dissolved in this water. Um, it's been shown that uh, these deep roots, well, these deep roots, of course, also die at the end of the season or at the end of the life cycle of this plant. And uh, this leaves uh, carbon behind in the deep soil. There is a more complete resource use and loss reduction in uh, crop rotations and intercropping when you use deep rooting crops. And this is, of course, a reason uh, also to increase biodiversity in cropping systems. And a hydraulic lift can also improve the uptake of insoluble nutrients like phosphorus uh, when the soil dries up. Um, it increases nitrogen mineralization and acquisition. Uh, it can increase root exploration in dry patches and thereby also increase nutrient uptake 
and it can keep their mycorrhizal symbionts alive during droughts, where it would otherwise die. Um, so how to study deep roots? So for my thesis, I went to the University of Copenhagen and I uh, was part of the Deep Frontier project that they have there. Um, this is their, their field from up high. Um, these are all deeply rooted crops and they, um, uh, yeah, well, they, they are focused on, on, on researching how they function and what they are capable of. And they also have this facility with these four meter high towers where they grow roots on top and where they can actually see the roots grow by uh, sliding open these um, panels. Uh, and I have a little video, I hope it works. I only wanted to show a couple seconds. Um, so the, underneath all these, um, Underneath all the plots, they installed these um, transparent tubes. They are five meters long, approximately, and they are uh, they the the roots grow into the soil and uh, also grow around these tubes. And then they developed a camera system that is this one, and the camera can be inserted into these hollow tubes. And it makes a picture every two and a half uh, centimeters. Um, and then on the, oh, sorry, no, I want to go back. On the right side, you see one of these pictures, and then they developed an algorithm that can differentiate the roots from the soil and the live roots from the dead roots. And then add up the whole length together, basically, and determine uh, how many roots um, grow in, at the depths. Uh, where the food was taken. Um, so, uh, let's see. Um, what they found out, um, the first one uh, I was involved with as well. So, Kainza and Alfa are two crop crops that grow deep roots to at least two meters depth. And Kainza was able to uh, take up 20 millimeters of water after the flowering from below one meter. So a lot of, like I said, a lot of research focuses only on the, on the first, sometimes 40 centimeters of soil. Um, so if you don't look at the deeper roots, you, you underestimate a lot. Particularly is another deep rooting crop that grew down until uh, more than three meters. And it's able to do this within four and a half months. So that's quite remarkable. And it showed a significant significant uptake from water uptake from below two meters and nutrient uptake from below three meters. Um, only this water uptake from these deep uh, portions of the soil was not enough to alleviate the drought response completely. And the nutrient uptake did not increase when the so topsoil dried up. So this, these are things that um, maybe were not expected, but that it, it contributes to, uh, to our knowledge about uh, Deep roots. But what was also find, found out is that the C input in the layer, well, I, I made a mistake here, but it's uh, the layer from 340 to 360 centimeters represented 8%, uh, 2.5%, and 2.7% for lucerne, currency, and rosin weed of the total C roots. So this, this means a lot for carbon sequestration potential of deep rooting crops. Uh, because at these great depths, uh, the carbon is also less likely to be released again from the soil. So how, do, how does one select for deep roots? So there is, of course, the lowest tech option. That is a selection for yield on the rain fed dry conditions, uh, which may indirectly be a selection for deep roots. But there is also a high-tech uh, high tech approach, and this was also done in the, at the University of Copenhagen, next to the field where I was working on, and it was called uh, Radimax. So what you see here is are fields that can be, well, a cover can be put over them so that no rain uh, can enter the, the fields anymore. Um, and then they grow a lot of crop varieties uh, in small rows. And underneath, they made uh, compartments on the left side in, in, in picture C, 
where they can uh, irrigate with water or where they can supply nutrients. And then they installed a lot, a lot of these transparent tubes where they can insert this cavity, uh, which you can see in picture D. And then it kind of looks like this. So you have small rows of maybe 50 centimeters of every, um, of every uh, variety of a crop. And then um, through the irrigation compartments, they can irrigate and then they can see how much of the, well, they can see how deeply rooted these uh, crop varieties were, but also how much water or nutrients they were able to take up from the depths. And then if you combine this with drone imagery, imagery uh, of uh, the canopy temperature, you can really see which varieties of, uh, in this case, I think it was wheat, um, uh, are in, in trouble when, uh, when it's dry. So vertically here, there, is, uh, there are like, I think uh, about 50 different cultivars of wheat growing. And you can see that on the left side, for example, there is one that's very, uh, has a very high temperature, so very uh, suffering a lot from drought um, and other ones are, are, are not. And this way you can select for deep roots. Uh, oh. Okay, sorry, that was it. That's thank it. you, Jan. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It was a lovely view on the on the, on the crop level, on crop system level, uh, about this uh, problem in drought. When we uh, are looking at the time, maybe there, if there's a, a burning question, we have time for one question. Uh, so let us know if you have a question. If not, then we can. Um, move on to the to the next speaker. I don't see anything. Wait, how does this work? Maybe you can stop sharing yours. Oh uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Go over. Yes, all right. Because, yes, because uh, our next speaker, Sylvia, and Sylvia also studied at Wageningen University. She did her master in uh, environmental science some years back. And after that, she spent uh, some time working uh, at the Sunsea Desert technology project working with uh, native species for reforestation in drylands. So she also has a lot of experience with dry, uh, dry conditions. And since the end of 2019, if I'm correct, she works at the Ecosystem Restoration Camp in uh, Altiplano. Um, and she's coordinator. So I think she has a lot of interesting uh, things to tell us about the Ecosystem Restoration Camps. And that's also what she will talk about tonight, about the work they do there from a more landscape uh, perspective. So we go uh, a step bigger than what Joost was uh, telling us about. And uh, we'll explore this side of the story. With that, I want to uh, give the floor to Sylvia. I don't know if you have a presentation or that you just um, want to talk, but uh, the floor yes. is yours. Thank you. Um, I hope I have interesting things to share. <laughs> I do have a presentation, so let me share the screen. Do you see my screen? Yeah, all right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So, yes, I'm going to talk a bit about everything that's been done at Campo Altiplano. Uh, the project started in 2017 here in the south of Spain. So we're going to talk about earthworks, about ground cover management, agroforestry system, and 
reforestation. Um, when to give you an idea of where we are and and uh, what is happening here, why why is this a complicated place? We are somewhere down there in the south of Spain, in the region of Murcia. Uh, we are on a plateau. Uh, so we, so it is the south of Spain, but we are at a very high elevation, around 1,100 meters above sea level, um, which makes it, uh, creates quite difficult conditions because we have uh, dry summers, like everywhere in the Mediterranean, but also very cold uh, winters. We have snow every year, uh, below zero temperatures, and a lot of wind. And we are in a farm which is a 1,100 hectares of land. And Camp Altiplano is five hectares inside this land. It used to be a barley field, a cereal field, like most of the farm that has since a few years started diversifying a lot and turning into a regenerative farm. So Camp Altiplano is part of a, let's say, of a larger system of regeneration in, in agriculture. So from annual crops, uh, only rain fed, everything is just rain fed. Um, in conventional agriculture, the farm was is organic since uh, the 90s, if I'm not wrong. Um, but still, indeed, the let's say the, the conventional organic way of farming. So when the project started, um, there was a plan made of how to change this place. And you see this is a design that is more or less representative of everything that has happened until now. Uh, there's uh, these lines that you can see, which are swales for rainwater harvesting. Then we have an agroforestry system mainly based on almond trees. And we have an area which is reserved for ponds and basically to create a biodiversity hotspot. So the earthworks were one of the first steps, uh, which is basically working with your land and take advantage of all the water that you get on your land and make the most out of it. We receive on average 300 millimeters of rain per year. And as I said, we have summer droughts, which means that it mainly rains between October and April. Um, it actually just rained quite a lot a couple of weeks ago, which is pretty surprising. And the ponds that were basically running dry uh, are now quite full because it was a quite fast and intense rainfall. Um, but yeah, usually that doesn't really happen in June. So basically we have to collect all of the possible water during the months in which we do have rainfall and use the soil as a sponge so that we keep it in there. You see in this picture, the direction of the arrows is the direction of the water flow on the land. So you see that it's different slopes going to different directions. And basically what you do with the earthworks is um, using these slopes to collect your water. And on the right side, it's a picture of the larger catchment. So this red line over here is the line of the ponds at camp. So camp is basically this tiny bit. Uh, but what you what this map tells us is that basically all the area inside the green line is a collection of water that might, in theory, end up here. Of course, that doesn't happen because it's a patchwork of landscapes. There is infiltration, there is evaporation, there is plants absorbing the uptake in the water. Um, but basically, it's to give an idea of why also camp was located here. This is the lowest part of the catchment, so we can definitely... Uh, collect loads of water in this area. So the swales, uh, there's four different swales at camp. The goal is indeed to collect rainwater and to reduce ero erosion. Um, and then there's this sentence here, decreased profit vulnerability to droughts. What does that mean? That basically, if you think of a cereal field, which is what this land was, and uh, which is on a slope, you have erosion, and then you make a swale to reduce this erosion and to increase the amount of water that stays in your land. Um, you're also losing agricultural land because you have a swale which is occupying a certain part of your land. But if you combine this swale with other plants, like you see in this picture, 
and like we did at camp. We planted uh, aromatics and native perennials on the in, inner side of the swale so that they have they have the smaller root system so they can uptake the water more easily. And then uh, also native tree, trees and shrubs on the opposite side uh, because they're the ones that can actually go deeper and take the rest of the water that flows after the swale. And basically, let's say that in a normal year with your cereal field, you're taking away part of your land. You compare a field without swales, good amount of rainfall, you have a better, like a bigger, larger amount of production on this on the field without swales. But on a dry year, you decrease your profit vulnerability to the drought. So you actually have a more resilient system because you're conserving water that you can, the, the plants can actually use during the summer. And in addition, you have aromatics and native trees and shrubs, which can be harvested at a certain point in time and provide you a further income. Then the ponds. Uh, the first ponds were dug in 2017 and uh, they have water throughout the whole year. As I said, the one on the right, which is the biggest one, was basically empty a couple of weeks ago. So, because it hasn't received like an intense rainfall since 2019. Uh, so we're quite happy it rained just now. And then there's two more that were built in 2019 and they are fluctuating much more with water. Why ponds? Um, they create a corridor where we see an incredible difference in terms of richness of plant species. You definitely see now that summer is coming and all the rest of the field is becoming yellow. The strip where the ponds are is staying green throughout the whole summer. Um, so it increases soil stability, water infiltration, nutrient cycling capacity, and deeper root systems. Um, and in addition, it's a biodiversity hotspot that load, loads of animals come into the ponds just because of the existence of water, you create a whole new habitat, let's say, in a, in a place where it's quite hard to find water. Then the following uh, work that was done on the land, on the land was uh, trying to decompact the soil. On the left side, you see a picture of a soil profile taken at camp at the beginning, where you see the topsoil is quite shallow. This is tiny cresses, so this is probably something about 20 centimeters. And then you can see right beneath a very compacted soil layer, what is called the hard pen, because of the work of the machinery only uh, working the, the topsoil and creating with their weight this compacted layer underneath. So with a machine called the Deep Reaper, um, they created basically cuts through this hardened part of the soil uh, so that water can infiltrate again, roots of the plants can reach deeper. There's also oxygen oxygenation taking place. The machine kind of looks like this. This is called Yeoman's Plow. Uh, here, they didn't use a Yeoman's Plow because they didn't have it but a subsoiler but it's a very similar function. Uh, so you see it's basically blades cutting through the land and slightly lifting it. So they don't turn the soil like a plow. They don't have an impact on the, on the different layers of the soil, but they just create these cracks that allow for, um, basically they, they promote the natural action of the plants to go deeper. Um, and this way you can slowly create deeper soil layers. In addition, uh, compost was spread on the whole land uh, to increase the amount of, uh, of uh, to, to, uh, to bring nutrients in and to increase the amount of organic matter. And uh, a variety of 30 different species of cover crops were spread to have a combination of, uh, for example, there were grains like wheat and, and oats, but also nitrogen fixing species. And the nitrogen fixing ones are the ones that take the nitrogen and make it available for the grains that have deeper systems and help with the decompaction. Then we experimented a bit with holistic management. In the first year in 2019, 
sheep were brought on the land. And then last year we had cows uh, for a couple of months between April and June. And we had electric fences around them and we're moving them in different parts of the, of the land. You can see on the right the map of all the different places where they grazed. Uh, they were staying there for three or four days, depending on the size of the plot. And then we would move them to a different place. We actually saw that uh, this was an, at least at the end of the summer, this was a very successful experiment because um, the land, the, the plots that were grazed had been left with, uh, yeah, basically without ground cover throughout the summer. Um, so it kind of stopped the whole nutrient cycling and didn't uh, directly improve the soil conditions. Uh, this was seen after a study that uh, Maria, one of the volunteers at King Hill did in September. Um, but seeing also the plant's composition here now in spring, it might be that after the rainfall, after the winter and the new spring, actually uh, the land managed to uptake all the nutrients that were left behind by the cows. And the agroforestry system. This is a part of Kemp, and it's a simplified version of what's there. So the main crop is almonds because they are, uh, the idea was to create a system which would be replicable here in the area and Many farmers are growing almonds, they're very adapted to this climate, they're drought resistant, but they're also resistant to frost. So they are combined with um, black locust, which is a nitrogen fixing tree. And in the lines where uh, there's no black locust, there were planted native shrubs and bushes also nitrogen fixing. And then alternated in between the lines of trees, there's aromatics uh, like rosemary, thyme, and, and lavender. So with the idea indeed of, of providing different sources of income in the same system. And this is more or less how it looks like. And the idea of alternating the lines of aromatics is to allow for mechanization, for example, in the moment of the harvest of the almonds, uh, you could still harvest all of the lines with a tractor if you wanted to, without going over the lines of aromatics. This is how the system was planted. The aromatics on the right and the trees on the left with an excavator and then planted by hand. But also with this tractor that basically creates a, a deep trench in which you plant the trees. And this is also very helpful because all the trees were planted on key line. So also in a way, um, as a way to maximize the amount of water that is collected through the lines. And with these trenches, you, you really maximize the, the impact of the key lines. We now have a vegetable garden that we water with the water from one of the ponds with a solar pump, it's pumped up to a deposit and then it's flowing down uh, with gravity. It's a no-till garden, we use loads of mulch um, and it, we use reap irrigation. So it's also minimum use of water. And then we have a, a little fruit forest close to the kitchen, which is irrigated with the wastewater from the kitchen. And finally, the reforestation part is um, also what we are working on in terms of drought release, the resilience on the larger scale, indeed, maybe more the landscape scale, um, basically to bring back to a resilient state part of the ecosystem, which is uh, degraded and it's in the lowest uh, succession stage, like you see in the picture on the left. We're working in different areas within the farm, but also in other farms in, around here with species that you can naturally find around here. So they're also native species, also adapted to the climate. And we always try and combine trees and bushes to have um, all the different layers of the vegetation. Uh, so this is, for example, species that we use in the driest parts. Uh, we have, we use oaks and pines and then bushes like juniper and, and black hawthorn. And then there are species that we 
planted in more humid areas like the area of the ponds at Kemp. And these are indeed more water requiring species like poplars and, uh, or willows. But they're also species that you can find uh, naturally in dry river beds or in gullies around here. What have we seen? We have, we are analyzing the input of our uh, practices at camp. Uh, you see here the results of organic matter samples that were sent to a lab in 2018, and where the organic matter content went for um, 1.4 to 2 percent. And we took samples again last year, and overall we saw an increase in, in the organic matter content, which is quite tiny, but considering the climate and, and the land, um, it's, a, it's quite a nice improvement. And I think this is what shows in the best possible way, the impact of what's happening at camp. These are satellite images. Um, taken in the same month in August, both of them. But the first one is from 2014, so much longer before camp started. And the second one is in 2019, so two years after camp started. And yeah, I think they are the best way to, to show the actual input of using a different type of agriculture in, in the same landscape. And that's it. So if you have any questions, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Sylvia. Really interesting story. I'm really impressed on uh, how much is uh, happening and uh, how big the achievements are uh, uh, in that area where you work. Indeed, if anybody has a, a question for Sylvia, uh, we have little time uh, for that and explain it to her question. And if not, we uh, we can move on to the to the discussion part. Okay, get small screen back. Yes. Um. So the discussion will be uh, in the breakout rooms, like I said, and will be consisting of two rounds. We have two uh, statements. And I think Louisa will uh, divide the breakout rooms in which, uh, yeah, you're open to discuss what you've heard. Um, reflect on, uh, on what you've heard indeed from the speakers, discuss the statements or just exchange thoughts. It's, uh, it's all up to, uh, it's up to you. And the statements are uh, a, a guide to uh, what, um, what you could do. The first statements are actually a question is how universal are these proposed solutions? So that the deep rooting that, uh, that Joe's talked about and the, the more landscape approach that Sylvia talked about in the, in the camp. And are those, uh, are these options or can they actually be scaled up? So that was the, that's the first input you get. So Louise. Yeah. I will start to break our rooms now. There will be four of them. Um, and maybe for the people in the live stream, it's still possible to join the discussion part also. There's a link in the in the Facebook live stream chat. Um, yeah, okay, I'm gonna start to break our rooms now. Yes, we are back. Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, it would be nice to hear uh... From uh, from the other people, what uh, what was talked about in the breakout rooms? So I don't know who I was. I was in uh, one of the breakout rooms. I don't know if somebody else from the other breakout rooms has some interesting stories they want to uh, to tell about what was discussed. Yeah, I basically want to try Kernza at camp. So that's what we talked about with Yoast. <laughs> uh, 
What do you want to go? I didn't catch it. I, I want to try the perennial uh, grains uh, that, that Yos was talking about, Carenza. Um, I've been thinking about it for a really long time. So let's see. Yeah. Oh, it's also, there was also a question I, I thought about while you were presenting is that um, how, how experimental are you with the things, the, the crops that you try? And what, what, how, how far do you want to go off? Because you say you use a lot, you use a lot of native species or species that are more common in this area. Is this something you want to stick by, uh, or are you really getting experimental as well uh, with different? Um, we're in a way we're quite um, non-experimental. Um, we maybe push a little bit the boundaries, like now that we just planted all these fruit trees, um, we'll put some pomegranates and some fig trees that are Mediterranean, but in like at this altitude is, is quite complicated. Um, but we, we definitely always try to use pieces that are used around here. So that it's kind of a system that resonates also with the people here, and um, it it can be seen as something that people know and and that could be interesting for them. So we are not really interested in bringing in uh, completely new species from somewhere far away that might work. There's things you can work with that already grow around here, and I think. Yeah, basically that's what we're trying to do. That's also it could also be a strength, like you say, of the of the, of the system. Let's see, we have uh, a busy bee in our midst who has uh, questions to both Sylvia and um, Joost. Maybe you want to uh, ask them yourself. Uh, I don't know. Elaborate on them. Otherwise, I will ask the questions. So, so, so good. So, the question for Sylvia is Have you uh, stopped grazing animals or, uh, or just during the summer? And are you going to experiment more with the grazing animals, I assume? Yeah. Um, yeah, th there's very practical reasons for why the experiment was short and we would like to experiment more, but for now it's probably not gonna happen. The cows belong to the farm. And last year there were eight cows and it was really manageable. They usually stay in a fenced area of around 10 hectares. Um, and basically we brought them to camp because the ground cover was amazing. There was loads of food for them. And we also had quite some parts where they could graze without trees. Um, there's the, the more trees we plant, the, the least, or at least we would have to wait until the trees are big enough so that the cows don't eat them. Plus this year, there's more cows on the farm and they're more, a bit more complicated to manage. So it wouldn't be really possible to bring them there and easily move them with electric fences. Um, we were thinking of trying with horse with a horse but um, possibly if that happens that's going to be at the end of the summer um, indeed to avoid this bare soils uh, problem basically that we had last year um, and we have we had chickens with idea also with a chicken tractor to move them around and and uh, and fertilize while we manage the ground cover all eaten by a fox multiple times. So we stopped with that for now. We have now turkeys <laughs> that we just got as a gift. So we were gonna see how it works with the turkeys. We're gonna start soon to put them in the turkey tractor and see what happens. Great. Sounds awesome. And then a question uh, for Joost. Um, maybe you already read it. Um, do you know any deep-rooted perennials that can handle a bit of 
salty soy sauce? Short answer, no. No, I don't know any, like, by heart. Uh, I would have to look that up, you know, but um, no, I don't know. I mean, there are, you know, you can, Peraniso is quite a broad term, and of course, there are also, like, on the on Earth, there are salt marshes. Uh, even close by here in the Netherlands, you have some salt marshes uh, on, the, on the islands. Uh, and of course, there's also plants that grow there, and, and a portion of those plants will be perennials. Um, but I'm not sure if those are the kind of perennials that you are hoping to hear about. Um, so uh, in terms of crops, I'm not sure. No, sorry. Is this something uh, something you would like to look in more, or are you, are you sticking with uh, drought as a big interest? Well, salt, salt and drought, they, they do have something in common, I would say. Um, yeah, no, it's salt tolerance is a whole not, a whole different topic. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe maybe at some point I would have to look into it for for, for work or something, but uh, not at this moment. I'm busy enough with other things. <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, yeah, since we are also with a small group now and we have not so much time out propose that we uh, we move to the second question and maybe the first the speakers can give their reflection on it because it's uh, I think it's a nice question and uh, let me share again so the second question is is there a place for high technological tools to combat drought worldwide for example remote sensing and precision ag uh, agriculture uh, so first, Sylvia, what uh, what is your stance on uh, on more high tech solutions, and are you using or are you open to use any tools, and uh, maybe not these ones but other ones uh, in your system? Um, yeah, I must, I must say when I first saw the pictures of the high tech selection of of deep fruiting crops. I had a moment of shock. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, and I, I think everything needs to work together. We're, I, we're actually, as uh, ecosystem restoration comes with the foundation, we're, uh, well, the foundation is basically trying to get this remote sensing um, uh, people that are working with remote sensing to help camps to basically analyze uh, in terms of biomass production and, uh, and basically improvement of the productivity of the land and our organic matter and differences in temperatures more as a way, well, as a way to measure the impact, but also as a way to show the impact. Um, so there's definitely uh, combination of very practical work on the land, uh, low tech, uh, a lot of work by hand. But indeed, these tools are existing and I think they, they can help us a lot in understanding what's happening. And I think the problem is when both worlds just go very apart from each other and, and practical side doesn't know what's happening in the scientific world and a uh, scientific world is very far away from the actual field. Yeah, yeah. and to add to that, I think that also a problem with high tech stuff is like this facility, for example, that I talked about. Well, I think, I think it's very cool, but on the other hand, only the big seed companies basically can afford this kind of stuff or the big universities. This is out of reach for uh, anyone, well, for like uh, small scale farmers, uh, especially in the global south and stuff. And uh, I think that's definitely a problem, but then I think it's also good to know that if you want to improve your, your crops uh, in dry conditions, then it's also possible to do that without all these high tech tools. But just, normal uh, 
selection under these dry conditions for, for yields, for example. Um, and, um, but you know, for water uptake, it's also quite, it's quite um, hard to also, for example, to do, to do without models. You really kind of need models to uh, estimate how much uh, water a crop evaporates throughout a, a year or throughout multiple years, because there's no way that you can do that without, basically. So also models, and then, yeah, it means that that it's kind of out of reach for for lots of people, and that these solutions and then the research really stays within the science. But yeah. So then it, it's more like an uh, it can be added value to to people that that um, that want to use it or that are able to use it, but it's not uh, it's. It cannot be uh, such a holistic uh, or a, a worldwide thing uh, Maybe yet. Not, yeah, and uh, yeah, or we should be more careful with how we distribute the knowledge and uh, and for example, also the seeds that come out of these uh, breeding programs. And I think it's also cool. I I also showed this picture of the of the uh, what is it called the the tool that was developed to uh, count these roots. Mm -hmm. the, the algorithm, that's the word I was looking for. The algorithm, I think, is open source. So anyone who wants to could download it kind of and then try and apply it to to their home. But then still you would need to, the camera and the, whatever. But I think uh, open source uh, high tech stuff is always better than not open source. True. Right. Yeah, that's right. I have a question maybe for uh, Sylvia, but also for yours. Like what could change from the, because I feel like the science and the practice going apart, and then especially when it comes to new technologies or old technologies, um, but how could we change that? And then more from the science university and research part like do you see any solution on how to stop this from happening because i feel like now a lot of research technological research um, happens from a technique side more than from what is needed from the farmers side mm -hmm. but i i find it difficult to kind of foresee how we could change this and how we could bring it back together or how we could, yeah. So I was wondering if you have some new perspectives on that, because you both studied it as it were also, which is definitely, definitely a place where that happens. Um, yeah. Uh, I, well, I think, uh, it kind of needs to come from both sides. So I think, yeah, science needs to move more towards the practice, but also I feel like uh, also on the, like farmers kind of also need, uh, there needs to be a mindset change amongst them as well. And in the Netherlands, for example, something that I sometimes am quite annoyed with is the amount of maize in the Netherlands. Like it's just a desert of maize, basically. Um, and when we're talking about deep roots, then maize is one of the worst kind of performing species. And late, lately we've been seeing the consequences, uh, like whole maize fields drying up in August already when they still have two, they should still have two mon uh, more months to, to ripen. And, um, and still, I'm not sure if I'm seeing any change from their side. Um, like, yeah, just across the road from here, there's a field where also during in the winter, there was there was a lot of water ponding. Um, and it's been a continuous cornfield for as long as I remember. But I, so I think, uh, yeah, I think a large part, uh, uh, a lot of, um, how do you say that, Winst? A lot of... Benefit? Benefit. I think it can Profit, get... Benefit, yeah. Yeah, benefit from... Because like crop, deep rooting crops, but also they're just nice crop rotations and, and also intercropping and strip cropping and stuff. They, these solutions exist already. 
So it's also a bit up to the farmer to uh, adopt them with support of science and the banks and whatever, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Sylvia, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah. Um, perspective. Yeah, I think now I'm I'm not a farmer, but I'm definitely much closer to the farmer perspective than than when I was in Wageningen. I'm living on a farm. I'm I'm talking to farmers, and I think what's missing is talking, <laughs> um, in the sense that. doing research about agriculture and never getting in touch. I'm, I'm not talking like, I, I don't know, you also your, your research, how it happened, how it was, but in general, I think indeed there's no direct contact with the farmer knowing what actually, what are you doing? Why are you doing what you're doing? And what is your actual problem? Like, what would you like to change? I think that's missing a lot. It's also not always possible because of timing, because of many things, because of, I don't know. But um, what I see, it's actually happening here, which I think is quite amazing. Uh, here on the farm, there's another um, organization which is called the Regeneration Academy. And it hosts students that are doing internship and thesis um, with themes related with regenerative, sorry, there's loads of slides. <laughs> <laughs> with the uh, themes related with regenerative agriculture and these uh, people are staying on the farm um, so it's a, a basically more of a demand uh, based research um, mm -hmm. they don't research things that wouldn't be useful on the farm uh, maybe they come with an idea and then it's discussed with, with, with the people here and with, with Alfonso, the owner, and Yannick, who's running the project. And they always try and find research that is actually useful in a way, and that could be implemented here. And, and then maybe the next student is coming and is checking on the results and saying, actually, it worked, it didn't work. Um, so I think, indeed, there is a just physical distance. And... Actually, in Wageningen, it would be quite easy to breach that because there's loads of farmers around. So, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe, yeah, instead of pointing fingers, just creating space for, for conversation and, and more, mm -hmm. say, yeah, maybe co collaborative processes. Yeah. Yeah, I guess money is sometimes the issue, yeah. but then you could and use time. some of the, yeah. You could have like a different kind of funding for research and then you could use part of that funding to create these kind of mini academies academies on different farms. That would be cool. Yeah, because I do <laughs> like these these collaborative processes do happen, but I think they're always in the social sciences side. Yes, so exactly. It's never really oriented on on like I don't know, improving practices or, or techniques or technology. Yeah. yeah I have to add those that the place where I'm working right now, the Louis Bock Institute, we we do a lot of research that yeah, that's true. Yeah. By, by by questions that farmers have, and we <laughs> we do talk to the farmers, and uh, not all the time, of course, but um, uh, definitely, uh, yeah, we have like uh, uh, meetings with them, and we tell them about our results, and then we ask uh, we ask them what they kind of want to do next uh, as well. Um, so we managed, yeah, we managed to get funding kind of for participatory research to some extent. Like it could be more participatory, I think, but it's definitely yeah. Yeah, a, good, uh, a good side. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. With that, I think we uh, we move to the, the closing of this, uh, of this nice webinar this evening. And for that, I want to ask both speakers to Tell me oh, one sentence. In one sentence, what did you uh, find most interesting of the, uh, the talk of the other speaker? I think we uh, start. Uh, Sylvia, you can uh, you can go first. I think the fact that um, 
when Yes was saying about the difference between a forestry and an agroforestry system, um, that they found out that walnut trees root deeper to avoid competition. Um, I found that really interesting and actually would like also to know more about that. Great. Well, I think it's really, really uh, like, nice and, and hopeful to see how quickly an uh, ecosystem or at least the soil can be restored. Um, I think that's the, that's the nicest takeaway message that I got. Okay, with these nice takeaway messages of both speakers, um, there's an end to this evening. Uh, I want to mention just if you want more, want to know more about Agroecology Europe or about Google Group, uh, check out the website, check out the Facebook. Uh, there's a lot of stuff happening all year round. Both organizations are doing great uh, work, I think. Uh, and just a small reminder, a small uh, mentioning is that Boelgroep this year celebrates its 50th birthday. Yes, we are already 50 years old. And that's why we are also um, yeah, having much more um, events. And also we have a festival um, later this year we also making a magazine and if you want to support us in making this magazine you can you can donate something um, go to this website geef.nl and search for Google group that's what i want to message uh, as a closing message to you all and i want to thank you all for listening and participating and talking and i want to especially thank both the speakers for your great uh, your great talks i thought there's a lot of new things for people and people really got inspired i think uh, I also want to thank the Agriculture Europe for uh, the co-organization of this event, and I hope we can um, we can do this uh, in future times more about different topics as well. So thank you guys, and have a, a great evening. Yeah, thank you very much. Have a good one.